Um, well, hello, good afternoon, and welcome everybody to day four of uh, UK Hydrogen Week here at Brunel University London. Um, this is the fourth uh, in a series um, of webinars titled Thinking Differently in Hydrogen, um, hosted by me, Brunel um, University's Royal Society Entrepreneur in Residence, and Dr. Alexander Reap. Um, each day we've been having presentations from a Brunel expert on a specific topic, followed by a talk from an SME who are developing technologies to help support the growth of the UK hydrogen economy. Um, a few housekeeping tips um, before we begin. Firstly, um, these webinars are all being recorded, so if that is an issue, please um, do leave. Um, and then once the entire series is finished, we will be putting them on the Brunel's YouTube channel, so you'll be able to, to go back and watch any that you may have missed of the series so far. Um, after the talks, we will be having a Q&A session, um, so please do either type questions in um, using the chat function on Zoom, or you can always um, keep your question and when the session um, Q&A session starts, raise your hand um, and uh, you can ask your question in person. Um, other than that, please do keep yourself muted for all of the talks just to make sure that um, um, people can sort of stay um, and, and hear what's going on. Um, so, so far we've had three great um, days worth of talks on hydrogen living labs, hydrogen combustion and hydrogen policy. Um, and today we are moving on and looking to alternatives to electrolysis. Now, um, we've been discussing a lot over this course of, uh, this course of webinars um, about green hydrogen and the use of um, renewable energy in electrolyzers to, to generate um, clean hydrogen. Um, and as some of you may know that the, 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 the creation of hydrogen has been given sort of a color spectrum. Um, and at the moment, yes, we've discussed a lot about green, um, but of course there are lots of the other areas which, um, which we have to, uh, to discuss. Now today, most of the hydrogen that's produced, it's about 99%, is through the use of uh, breaking down hydrocarbons. Um, and this in the color spectrum is known as either gray or brown. Um, gray when you use um, sort of methane um, and split that into uh, hydrogen and CO2, or there's also brown hydrogen, which is the use of, of coal. Now, for both of these, large amounts of CO2 is generated, um, and a lot, of, and, and because of what it's called, none of it is actually uh, kept. All of it is basically put out into the atmosphere, which of course is very environmentally unfriendly. Um, and so, there are ways to reduce this. Um, are there ways to reduce this uh, environmental impact while still actually being able to get hold of the, uh, the sort of the hydrogen capacity, which of course we will need in future if we're going to fully decarbonize everything. Um, and one of the ways to do this is, of course, the storage and utilization of the carbon that's being produced. And really, these are the focus of the talks today. Um, so firstly, we've got uh, Dr. Shervan Balam Mohammadi, who's a postdoctoral research fellow here at uh, Brunel University in the Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, he's focused on design development and investigation of combined blue hydrogen production uh, and the carbon capture processes based on steam, ref um, steam methane reforming processes. Um, Shaban has over 10 years prior research experience on CO2 capture and utilization, renewable energies, biofuels, process integration, separation technologies, absorption, and novel solvents for CO2 capture aimed at energy optimization. So Shaban, it's, uh, let me de share this and it's over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex and Janet for invitation. So let me first share. I hope that you see the presentation. Yeah, we've got it. Okay. So thank you so much, Alex and Janet, for the invitation and the introduction. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sherwan, and I would like to talk a little bit about my hydrogen pro project here at Brunel. Um, blue is a new green, a new process configuration to produce clean hydrogen. Uh, before going further, let me first introduce our research group here at Brunel. Uh, currently, we are the biggest research group at Chemical Engineering Department. Uh, our principal investiga investigator and supervisor is Dr. Salman Masudi Soltani. Uh, we have here Ben and Mike, who are senior PhD students working on CO2 capture using waste materials as adsorbent. 
we have also Jess. Uh, she is also senior PhD student, but she's working on water treatment using adsorbent. Uh, Billy is a first year PhD student working on clean hydrogen production, and me also working on the same project. We also have two new PhD, uh, Hassan and Kofu, and hopefully we have a new postdoc uh, as well. So it seems that our research group is growing and going to save the world. Uh, why we should save the world? Here is the reason uh, I will explain. Based on the latest report by IEA uh, in the World Energy Outlook uh, report of 2022, there are basically three scenarios for the future of CO2 emission and energy in transportation. First is the stated policy scenarios or steps that shows the trajectory implies by today's policy setting. The other one is the announced pledge scenarios or APS that um, assume that all aspirational targets announced by governments are met on time. And uh, the other one is the net zero emissions by 2050 uh, that maps out a way to achieve a one and a half degree Celsius stabilization in the rise uh, uh, the global average temperature, along with a universal access to modern energy by 2030. As we see uh, in the picture on the left, uh, the APS and the net zero by 2050 are the only scenarios that lead us to uh, deduct the CO2 emissions into a safe zone. The figure uh, on the right uh, shows that the role of hydrogen and hydrogen-based fuel in the in, in the future of transportation, and um, it is in, inevitable as you see the portion of that. Now, uh, considering these facts, uh, let's see why hydrogen is so important. Uh, hydrogen is a fuel uh, of the future because it has the potential to provide a clean and sustainable uh, source of energy. Uh, as you know, when hydrogen is burned, uh, only heat and water produced. And also hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe, and it can be found in a variety of sources, including water, biomass, and fossil fuels. Uh, hydrogen also could be used in multiple sectors, including aeros aerospace and maritime, heavy transportation, industry, and hard to decarbonize activities, and also in peak load power supply. Uh, also, the energy density of hydrogen is much higher than the other types of fuels and is much safer. Uh, hydrogen production can be divided mainly into four categories represented by colors, as Alex says, uh, said, uh, gray, blue, turquoise, and green. Uh, well, we know that uh, what is green hydrogen, electrolysis that using renewable resources such as wind or power, um, uh, solar power. And it's a um, very promising technology, but has some challenges such as uh, the cost, the scalability, efficiency, availability of water, and uh, limited production uh, capacity. Uh, on the other side, gray hydrogen is the most common type of hydrogen production, and that is hydrogen from the fossil fuels. Uh, one famous example is the process called steam methane reforming, or SMR. And currently, hydrogen production with SMR gives about 830, uh, 830 million ton uh, CO2 per year. It is almost 9 kilogram CO2 per 1 kilogram produced hydrogen. Uh, SMR uh, is also widely, uh, is it the most widely uh, form of hydrogen production. And I announced that 95% of hydrogen comes from fossil fuels, and half of that is produced via SMR. Uh, so and blue uh, blue hydrogen is same as the gray, um, but with the addition of carbon capture and storage technology. And we have also turquoise hydrogen is similar to blue hydrogen, um, but with using of renewable energy resources. It is rel relatively relatively new term uh, for hydrogen production, and pyrolysis of methane is one example of this uh, method. What we are doing here is to is that we want to improve the blue hydrogen or SMR process to make it cleaner like uh, green hydrogen or even better. This is a SMR a schematic diagram of SMR process. In this process, uh, we use four energy intensive uh, reactors to produce hydrogen from methane. 
Uh, the produced gas contains a considerable amount of uh, impurity and CO2. So uh, hydrogen purification like PSA unit and uh, carbon capture like amine scrubbing unit are needed in this uh, um, process. All this causes that process to be very energy intensive and costly. Uh, this is called blue hydrogen, but we can make it uh, better. The alternative option could be an intensified process called sorption enhanced steam methane reforming or SESMR that use uh, that used enhanced sorbent to absorb CO2 produced inside the reformer. Uh, removing CO2 from the inside the reformer will help the reaction to produce more hydrogen. Uh, then the spent sorbent goes to regeneration vessel and uh, they're almost pure CO2 separated and fresh sorbent goes back to the reformer. The purity of hydrogen is very good in this process and even can be improved more. So um, probably no need for further purification. All this means that we have eliminated most of the disadvantages of the blue hydrogen. We can uh, even improve it further. Uh, here is the reformer, for example, where methane is converted into hydrogen in the presence of a catalyst, usually a nickel-based catalyst. The reaction needs a huge amount of heat. And uh, what we can do is to burn a portion of methane with oxygen, and heat helps the reform. And this heat helps the reforming reaction to take place. And we call this uh, as a sorption-enhanced autothermal reforming, or SEATR. So generally, it has been proven that SESMR or and SEATR have these advantages compared to SMR with carbon capture or ATR with carbon capture. About 25% lower levelized cost of hydrogen, uh, more than 50% reduction in capex with similar OPEX, around 97% uh, CO2 capture rates with the same uh, hydrogen purity, uh, less, uh, for, less than 40% uh, lower carbon footprint, smaller physical footprint due to the integrated uh, nature of the SESMR, and also potential to scale it up to hundreds of uh, megawatts. So um, I give you an example. Uh, this is the design that I developed in the simulation software to investigate different parameters in the process. The novelty of this uh, design uh, compared to the other uh, simulation is that I use detailed kinetic data uh, for the reaction inside the reformer. So when we want to optimize the process or analyze the capex and opex, this would be more realistic. Um, the design simul this design simulates uh, both SESMR and SEATR. Uh, I applied statistical methodology to investigate some important parameters. The key performance indicator I have studied here is our um, hydrogen yield, hydrogen purity, methane conversion, and the CO2 capture efficiency. Also, I compare SCSMR and SCATR. Uh, to verify and uh, validate the model, the kinetic model, uh, I validated with experimental data in the literature. And the mean error was calculated to be 3.19% indicate that a reasonable degree of accuracy of the model, uh, of the developed model. Here are some uh, results from the design. Uh, I compared the optimum op uh, condition for SMR and SEATR. We can see that the required temperature for SEATR is uh, 641 degrees Celsius. That is much lower than SESMR. Also, the pressure is higher, which is suitable for hydrogen storage at downstream. Uh, we also see that the purity of hydrogen in SCATR is higher than SCSMR. Um, that one is almost 97%, and in SCSMR is almost 95%. And about uh, CO2 capture efficiency, again, SCATR is much better than SCSMR, about 10% um, better. And another one is that uh, thanks to UKCCRSRC collaboration fund, uh, we could initiate a collaboration with Cranfield University and Dr. Peter Clough Research Group. 
Dr. Klof is leading the Hyper project at Cranfield, which is almost 8 million pound project founded by BASE. And um, Hyper is the only SESMR pilot plant in the UK and uh, is a state of art and world leading SESMR pilot plant with a capacity of one megawatt. Um, the plant can produce high purity hydrogen with about 97% uh, uh, carbon capture and the capex and opex are su substantially reduced and the technology readiness level improved from level four to level six. Uh, well, in future, under my work package, I will develop a rigorous kinetic-based model for the adsorption side of the SESMR and SEATR and investigate the energy, ex uh, the exergy of the system and the capex and opex of the process. And thanks, uh, they are our partners in this, uh, in our research projects. And thank you so much for your attention. Any question? If I think if we'll, we'll leave the questions to the end, but if anyone does have any, do please feel free to uh, to put them into the chat. Um, so yeah, thanks, Shevan. Very, very, very nice You're talk. Um, and so yeah, blue blue hydrogen, as you sort of mentioned, is the uh, the, the storage of uh, of CO two um, from the process. Um, but what if rather than generate CO two, you can actually sort of generate the carbon as solid carbon? Um, so you can um, do other things with it. Um, we sort of quickly mentioned that this is known as turquoise hydrogen um, and is the focus of um, Suiso um, Limited. Um, here with us today, we have the founder and CEO um, of Suiso, Stuart McKnight, who has over 30 years experience in building and financing technology businesses. So Stuart, please share your screen and go ahead. Thank you, Alex. And also thank you, Sharvan. You've... Um nicely set up the various differences between the various colors of hydrogen and fits in nicely here. However, um, we're going to slightly be controversial on this and as much that you'll see the, the color of my deck here is definitely green. And yet um, both Alex and Sharvan were implying that what we do is turquoise. So we don't really believe in colors if i'm being absolutely honest with you and i'm going to talk you through that um and because we think that our process even though we're using um uh, basically natural gas or biogas preferably as a, a feedstock in reality we in most circumstances we will actually be uh, greener or have less emissions than electrolysis. So let me get started. The, what is Suizo? Well, Suizo is uh, developing a microwave-driven pyrolysis process. Uh, this process effectively is small scale. It's partly because it's microwaves, using microwaves as the key um, a driving mechanism. So we can fit it all in our reactor into a shipping container. That shipping container, once we've got all of it optimized and over the next year or so, we'll be able to produce one ton of hydrogen per day. And as you can see in the diagram here, effectively the way we're envisaging it is that we will have renewable electricity coming in, biogas or natural gas coming in too, and our outputs are hydrogen and green carbon black. And I'll circle back to that in a second. Um, because of just the, the very nature of methane pyrolysis, it's a, um, a very um, low um, energy, uh, low cost process. And if, because we capture all the, carb uh, the carbon, uh, we've got very low emissions too. So the, the reality is, is that we've got a super efficient process. Also because we can put it in a a shipping container, we can put these shipping containers anywhere we can get a gas connection and an electricity connection. Now that's really, really important. That effectively means rather than making hydrogen at a centralized hub or a very large production center, we can do it wherever the hydrogen is actually needed. So we eliminate the need for distribution which is possibly the most expensive part of the process. And I'll come back to that in a second. 
uh, as I say, we capture the carbon in a solid carbon black form. And that carbon black has got a substantial commercial value in itself. So all the energy we're putting in to generate the hydrogen also produces carbon black, which is also our second revenue stream. So economically, we have a huge advantage. To lay this out in a bit more simply, uh, already, uh, Sharvan, and I guess if you've been listening to the sessions uh, this week, you will have seen that you know the, the three main methods really are SMR, electrolysis, and I put the squeeze of sort of bubble there, but in reality, that's methane pyrolysis. Our breakthroughs are that um, on with against SMR with no carbon capture, uh, we've got ninety percent lower CO two emissions than SMR. That's a huge benefit. We can get 75% lower energy consumption than electrolysis. And, and we think that, that will go to greater than 80% once we've uh, uh, optimized our processes. We have the lowest cost of delivered hydrogen because we're producing it on the site of the user. And then there's a peculiar thing, and that's this uh, CO2 emissions that result from replacing existing carbon black production. I think is uh, part of it, as uh, Sheridan alluded to, is that when you are, the way that uh, carbon black is traditionally uh, created uh, right now is very much at the end of the uh, petroleum refining process. Uh, and when you've all your, you know, once you've taken your um, bitumen and tar and all the really nasties at the bottom of the process, you then burn it and, and what's left is carbon black. So for pretty much every kilo of um, hydrogen that we produce, we are reducing um, uh, just short of 10 kilos of CO2 emissions from current carbon black processes. And that's a huge saving. To put that graphically, uh, we've just completed a big exercise for Bayes uh, using their figures, not ours where they wanted to compare us to electrolysis. And the key thing about this is this is electrolysis not driven by the magical, um, nothing can go wrong, uh, uh, absolutely cap um, captured renewable energy piece. This is electrolysis from today's grid, or should I say last year's grid, by figures uh, given to us by Bayes. So because we use about 20% of the energy required, electrical energy required by electrolysis to, uh, for our process, we actually have a significantly less footprint on than electrolysis has a huge gain. So we, we're about 3.3 um, uh, kilos of uh, uh, CO2 uh, per kilo of um, per kilo of hydrogen compared to 9.6. So when electrolysis is fired from the grid, today's grid, uh, it's nowhere near green. It's ridiculously bad and really stupid. The only way electrolysis is green is where it's got a captured renewable resource, in which case that's great, that's really good, but it doesn't really exist in any substantial form in the UK now and it will be 2035 here, as you can see. And uh, again, these are figures from Bayes, not, they're not our figures, where at which point it'll go down to 1.4 kilos of CO2 per kilogram of hydrogen. We, of course, will also reduce our electrical energy there, but we still have our costs in terms of the, we do use fossil fuels and we have to, um, the fossil fuels, will, There'll be some leakage and then also some leakage in the production of those fossil fuels. So we sit at 1.7 in 25, uh, 20 or uh, 35, they're at 1.4, not a huge difference. But of course, what we're not including is the carbon offset from the reduction of uh, carbon black from traditional methods produced from traditional methods, in which case we are massively negative we're removing um, CO2 emissions by using our process. Now we think that's pretty compelling and we hope you think that's compelling too. 
it's certainly catching a lot of people's eyes when we're speaking to them and a lot of the customers we're engaging with are already waking up to the fact that the electrolysis is not quite the angel that people think. And particularly when you look at the economics. So again, these are 2022 figures. We haven't updated them for current prices, but effectively the core economics of it, our process to make a kilo of hydrogen, uh, we'd use about um, 1.50 of natural gas, about 60p of electricity, and some miscellaneous other bits and pieces and capex um, uh, attributed over the life of the plant, probably two pounds 10. That gets us to four pounds 20 total cost for that uh, hydrogen. However, with that hydrogen, um, we also create um, three kilos of carbon black, which has a value 2.7. So we net to, uh, to £2.70 or £4.20, our net cost is around about £1.50 per kilo of hydrogen at today's prices with all this super expensive uh, gas and electricity. By comparison, uh, electrolysis fed from the grid at today's prices uses £4.20 of electricity and again has equivalent other costs of £1.80. So a, uh, a net price of six pounds per kilo of hydrogen. And that's really, if you go anywhere in the country right now and you try to buy hydrogen, it retails at somewhere between 11 and 12 pounds, sometimes a lot more. So if we at today's prices can get our hydrogen round about there, you can understand where we think we've got a, um, a significant commercial value, uh, pro uh, valuable proposition. Give you a feel for uh, just how to overall look in some of the output numbers. So if we focus on our box here, we'd put it for to get um, um, about a, a daily sort of routine. To get a ton of hydrogen out, we'd be looking at putting in about half a megawatt in a, in a day and about four tons um, uh, uh, biogas or, or natural gas. Um, we put that for our system, out comes a ton of hydrogen and about three tons of carbon black. It would then go into a compressor to, so we could actually put it into storage or straight through into a fuel dispenser into industrial applications, which might be small steel production um, and other uh, processes. The one which gets us very excited is get gas grid injection. And gas grid injection is a market that no one really talks about, but the reality is that the it is highly likely that uh, we'll, in relatively short period of time, probably two to three years, the, the UK and many countries around the world will start putting in a little bit of hydrogen into the gas network. And the, the data to date looks as if the, the most grids can cope with up to 20% hydrogen going into the gas grid. Uh, our systems, of course, are ideal for that, not to put it in the uh, you know, large scale, but uh, out at the periphery of the network, where they need to top up the hydrogen in the in the pipes, our system can be connected to the pipe, take out the the methane, convert it to hydrogen, and then put the hydrogen back up, so that there's a consistent, say, twenty percent blend of hydrogen in the gas grid network, and we're already talking to various. Uh, gas network operators um, about how that might actually work. So we're pretty excited about it. The, of course, a, a part of our key point, of course, is that we have a distributed solution. That doesn't mean we're going to be the biggest solution. And some of the output that, for example, Shervan was talking about, or some of the big initiatives from uh, BP up in Tees Valley or Ineos and Grangemouth and um, Shell, um, or maybe Esso actually down in Crawley. These are all significant plants producing huge amounts of hydrogen. But the problems they have is that um, they may have relatively low cost hydrogen, 
But as soon as you try to get that to a customer who's not on your doorstep, you incur very, very significant costs. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you a chart in a second, which makes this a bit clearer. But effectively, as soon as you go over 35 miles, you're incurring about a pound of extra costs on it. And given that the, um, the cost of producing the hydrogen is, well, certainly from our side, we can do it for £1.50 for a kilo. If you are getting to a situation where you're adding um, uh, this sort of distribution cost to the hydrogen, the actual cost that the customer pays will be very, very significant. That's if you're distributing it by truck. If you're doing it by pipeline, it gets even more crazy. The numbers just go out of this, out of this world. Our system really takes advantage of the existing UK ga gas grid network. There's 283,000 kilometers of gas pipeline in the UK right now. Our system can be plugged into any point in that network and produce hydrogen on site. That is a significant difference to most of the other schemes. I put this chart in here just to emphasize that the point I made earlier, but this gives you a feel for um, the, the additional distribution costs as you go through there. And it's not quite an exactly linear relationship, but it's, it's pretty close. And as you get out to 50 miles, strangely enough, you're adding about £1.20 to get out to 100 miles. And it's, you know, again, £2.20, give or take. And, and that's the killer um, in terms of getting a, a, a hydrogen to where it's needed. To give you a feel for it, one of the, the biggest uh, requirements for hydrogen and the, the, one of the most likely early adopters will be heavy transport, HGVs effectively. And what I've mapped out here is the, where the most of the HGVs are being used in the UK right now. So not surprisingly, it's all along the motorways. Not surprisingly, there's big um, levels of activity around the Midlands and around London. But as soon as you go out to the slightly more um, rural areas out in Cornwall um, and Wales, and of course my, my own home country, Scotland, uh, the HGV activity goes down quite substantially. However, in terms of where hydrogen is being produced at volume, it's being produced at volume here, up here, here. Let's get my, my Tees Valley right. I think it's about here, well, Tees Valley. Uh, no, sorry, here. And, um, and down here. Now that will change. But if you then put that 50 mile radius where it stops to become economic for it, it means there's a huge swathe of the country who can't be economically served with large scale hydrogen production. And they're going to have to have smaller distributed hydrogen production in these areas. And that's where the game changes. Now, I, I could go on and on and on about this. The only thing I'll leave you with is a little bit about uh, carbon black. The part of the problem we think with um, some of the SMR processes is what you actually do with the CO2. And you know we've been talking to a lot of people about it. We, we really want to work with biogas, but biogas produces a huge amount of CO2. Uh, most of the biogas producers can just about manage it, but it's still very difficult for them to, to actually get productive uses for their CO2. The people like BP and their big plant, they're actually shipping it back to oil wells to then um, allow them to extract more product from those oil wells, which again is economically sensible. But the amount of space available to for offshore storage of CO2 or salt mines and various places like that is limited. It's not infinite. And the actual need for CO2, whether it's for fizzy drinks or beer, which is not a bad use for it, is, um, you know, is again limited. So what can you do? 
So we think a viable alternative is to not to make CO2, but in fact to make carbon black in its purest form. Carbon black in this form is very easy to handle. It's completely inert. And you basically you put it into sacks. And then it's used in tires, it's used in industrial rubbers, things like gaskets and hoses and tubes, as we say that, it's used in batteries and inks. So it's a significant piece. It can be upgraded in many cases uh, to larger markets like activated carbon, graphene, et cetera, and those are huge markets. So to take CO2 and just pump it into the ground and hope for the best is one strategy. But we think there's probably much more effective, certainly more economically sound way of actually using the carbon when you decarbonize the gas. Now, if I guess if I leave you with one message is fossil fuels and hydrocarbons aren't necessarily bad. You just need to capture the carbon. And that's what we think we can do. I'll leave you that. I'm more than happy to take any questions that you might have. If anyone wants to contact me, please do. We are actually recruiting. So um, if you're interested, contact me. Thanks very much, Stuart.